The more years that pass between historical events and the present day, the greater the toll that time takes on the survivors. In 2011, only one veteran of the Second World War was present at this remembrance ceremony. He did not wish to discuss his wartime experiences, but his uniform indicates that he was a paratrooper. Airborne troops had to endure some of the fiercest fighting of the entire war. These men were highly trained infantry who would be deployed in enemy-held territory to seize key objectives until they were relieved by the main invasion force. You just followed orders. You were trained to such a degree in the airborne that you didn't need a second command. If you were told to do anything, you did it. There's no argument about it, you did it. And we were all trained to that degree to do that. But uh, I, I think that was why we were better than other units. Because uh, everybody knew what their job was and we were trained to do it. And pride in the regiment as well entered into it. In few other campaigns was the contribution of airborne troops more significant than in the invasion of Normandy. Since 1942, American troops and equipment had been building up in Britain with the eventual aim of launching a seaborne invasion of German-occupied Western Europe. By the middle of 1944, a massive Allied army of over three million men had been assembled. But the Germans had also been making preparations. Since 1942, they had been constructing the Atlantic Wall to hold back Allied invasions. The Atlantic Wall had not been completed by the time the Allies were ready to invade, but its minefields, its artillery batteries, its bunkers and its machine gun nests all posed a threat to their offensive. The beaches of Normandy were selected for the operation as they were less heavily defended than those at Calais. In an attempt to reduce the German forces in Normandy, the Allies carried out a deception plan which successfully convinced Hitler that the invasion would really be at Calais. Did you have any idea that you might be going to Normandy? Well, not Normandy, but France, yeah. where we were going to land, we had no idea. No. We were on guard duty while they were preparing for it. We used to parade, uh, we were at Cern Coat House, uh, near Netherhaven, that was our divisional headquarters, mm -hmm. and we were patrolling 24 hours a day, with wearing slippers, mm -hmm. armed, patrolling round. And at that time, we were told that if anybody failed to uh, answer the challenge, you were authorised to shoot, because these officers were preparing the various operations that were going to take place. And all we were doing was security round and round. Most of the Allied troops would land from the sea, but a select few would invade from the air. Several hours ahead of the main assault force, American paratroopers would be dropped in the west of the invasion area, whilst British paratroopers would be deployed in the east. The purpose of these airborne assaults was to weaken German defensive positions and to secure key strategic targets such as bridges and roads to enable the Allies to move inland and not become trapped on the beaches. At uh, 24 hours before we took off, we were then told uh, what they do. And, and his last words were, failure, gentlemen, is not an option. After he explained to us what we were to do, that was what he said, Captain Shearer, failure, gentlemen, is not an option. It has to be done. 
and apparently the same words were used by Colonel Ottaway when he told his men that because we discussed it. They said, yeah, we were told the same thing, failure is not an option. Because if we had not cleared Ronville, set up, they had not got the, knocked out the batteries, there have been thousands of soldiers killed or wounded on Sword Beach the following morning. The invasion was scheduled for the 5th of June, but stormy weather conditions meant that it had to be delayed for 24 hours. And then we were told about tea time on the 5th, it's on tonight, definitely on. So we were all, the gliders were all lined up. But uh, ours was pulled by a sterling. There were a line of sterlings on one side and the uh, hawser gliders on the other and sterling would pull in and glider would come click down the ropes and we'd all climb on and all try to look jolly. Roll me over, lay me down and when we, when they, when we took to the air it all shut up. <laughs> Everybody was quiet. We tried not to show it, but we all were frightened to death. Once we were on, uh, you, you ex I don't know how to explain this. Um, you just accepted what will be, will be, but the thoughts that we would feel never entered our heads. It, nobody ever thought that we couldn't do what we were asked to do. Every, well, this is why Dr. Uh, General Gale was thought so much of. He'd inspired us all to... Uh, such a degree that uh, everybody knew what they were going to do and we would do it. Now we don't know whether, I still never found out whether it was the glider pilots taking a vase of action from anti-aircraft fire which was heavy but our tow rope had just snapped and so we were cast off and you had to go down and hope for the best. You all, you're sitting there in a row, you link arms and you lift your feet up and you pray to God your number's not up because there's just a crashing and a roaring and a, a broken wood and you're coming in at a hundred and odd miles an hour in pitch darkness and you just hope that uh, you've made it. Them that were killed, there's quite a few that were killed in the Londons. We were lucky, a greater broken too, but uh, other than being bounced about uh, and a few bruises, I think everybody was uh, was alive, you know that. But there was an awful lot that weren't. Even at Pegasus Bridge, two blokes drowned in the glider. They were flung into the water. A lot of us were bodily shaken, a lot of the glider pilots were very bodily shocked. A young officer asked two of us to see if we could find out any road or tracks. Mm -hmm. Anywhere, we stumbled across a few hedgerows in the dark. We hadn't a clue where we were, we got to a small track and it was actually this lad, the lad called Jones, decided I'll go a hundred yards this way, if you go a hundred yards that way and we'll meet back and see if we can make our way back to the glider. Uh, as I say, I met up with some Canadians who had strongly advised me to stay with them, which I did. And we, we finished up at Francoville Pledge which was uh, in which was a German gun battery, which contained four heavy guns, which were trained on Sword Beach. Now we met up with the paratroopers, who kept coming in in dribs and drabs. Uh, Colonel Ottaway, who was a former Royal Ulster Rifle Major, he was now a Lieutenant Colonel in command of the Ninth Para Battalion. The company, sir, my company sergeant major was. William Cunningham, who was now RSM of the, of the 9th Para. Uh, we were, uh, we laid there for a bit, waiting on the rest of the battalion, but who never came. So instead of 600 men attacking, there were 150 of us, including a couple of Canadians and myself. And they, we went in on three groups, uh, rushed the barbed wire, some lads hurled themselves on it, and we ran over the top. Uh, there were explosions going on all around us and we realised we were running through a minefield. But actually we got to the gun emplacements, charged in, 
there was a bit of hand to hand fighting, but uh, literally we wiped the German garrison out, which was a, a number of 130 odd. But uh, we'd suffered as well because of the 150 of us. At the end uh, of the battle, there were 70 of us left standing, the rest have been killed or wounded. Once inside the battery, the paratroopers tried their best to disable the guns using their improvised explosives. How did you feel during the battle at all? I mean, did you feel frightened or were you just told to get on with it? Yes, both frightened and, and again, excitement, frightened and, you know, it's, it's hard to describe now, but fear as well. At, uh, and especially, but most of the fight was over then shells began landed on the battery. It was the Germans had he ordered his own artillery to open fire on the battery because we were in it. So we had to clear out of there fast. On the afternoon of the sixth of June, the Germans reoccupied the Merville battery. Two of the guns were put back into action, but their rate of fire had been significantly reduced, so although the paratroopers had not destroyed the artillery, they had decreased the battery's fighting capabilities. And as we moved off, uh, Colonel Ottaway suggested that as I should have landed near Ronville, a young officer, uh, engineer I believe he was, and I should head that way because he was responsible for areas of Randall. So the two of us set off and uh, after a few exciting encounters that were actually fired on by some of our own troops, uh, we got to Ronville late on in the afternoon just as the six airborne gliders were swooping in. They were coming in, the bulk of them were coming in. And uh, I arrived at my destination which was Ronville. Well, we then had to clear Ranville, which I think it was a company of the German 21st Panzer Division were based there. But with the Paris and whatnots, we cleared it and we set off to set divisional headquarters up at a place called the Bass Ranville, just in the outskirts of Chateau. But the Germans had it zeroed in and we took quite a pounding. And that was uh, where quite a lot of our lads were lost from our platoon. And some of the senior officers were wounded and badly and killed. So we, we moved up to an, an esplanade, higher ground at Ronville. And there we were there for the next, oh, I would say month. By the end of the 6th of June, around 150,000 Allied troops had landed on five separate beaches across Normandy. Overall, the invasion had been a success. They had made it ashore and casualties were lighter than anticipated. But none of this would have been possible without the Allied air forces controlling the skies. Air superiority would prove essential in Normandy. Aircraft were used to assault German defensive positions and to protect the invasion force from Luftwaffe attacks. The unit that I was on in the UK was sent over for D-Day. Mm -hmm. We were the first squadron over the beachhead because it was one of the better squadrons that had been formed and I was one of the 12 on the squadron who were sent over. Were you attacked at all when you were sent over? No, no, no. The Germans, I think, were hiding somewhere. I mean, our job was uh, was to uh, to keep an eye on things, really. Uh, once they'd established a base there, then they sent us to land over there as well. I had an engine pack up on me, but it wasn't because I'd been shot down. Mm -hmm. It was dead because there'd been some fire and it had hit my engine. You never knew if it was your own people, to be honest. 
I personally didn't believe in uh, in bailing out. If I could get the plane down, that was the answer, the best answer. If you if you bailed out, the aeroplane was ruined. If you went down with it, there was always a chance they could recover that. We were able to carry a pistol if we wanted to, but it was always dangerous to carry a pistol because if you were shot down, as I was, for example, and the Germans, they, they, they would think, oh, if he's got a pistol, fire, and that's it. So you didn't fire, you didn't take a pistol. And when I was shot down, I was aiming to where I knew the Americans were coming down yeah. on the other side of the field. Did he come down with landing gear up? No, not on the beach. No, you didn't land uh, with, your, with your undercarriage down. That was really, for if you were, if you were near an aerodrome or something like that, you didn't, you didn't force land in unknown territory. There was plenty of fields around there and land at the time I, I landed. So what happened during the landing? I mean, did, did the plane spin around at all or did it almost... Yeah, it just hit the ground and spun round. And I got out quickly in case it caught fire and that was it. Once I'd force landed on the ground, I knew that whoever came, I couldn't do much about it anyway. Uh, I knew that there were Germans not far away, I could tell that by the gunfire. And then a, a Canadian tank came and picked me up to take me back to the beach, he had to send me back to Britain. And they said, come on, get in here quick, get the hell out of it, now we're going. There's Germans over there, there's a line of Germans waiting to fire. Well, actually, a German trench, isn't it, about that sort of Yeah, out of a trench at the far side of the beach. I didn't know that. In the days following D-Day, the Allies set about consolidating the beachhead and bringing in reinforcements and supplies. At the same time, the Germans were launching counter-attacks to try and drive the invaders back into the sea. Also, uh, the Germans were attacking us from, it was, uh, I'm trying to think, Brevel, Brevel Ridge, which is a series of, hot, of hard high ground just to the north of us. And then we realised they'd brought a new division in from Le Havre, 20,000 odd men with self-propelled guns and tanks who kept probing and attacking us for the next month. They actually were on the verge of breaking through, I think it was a week after D-Day, uh, when General Gale, who was our divisional commander, he was nicknamed Windy Gale, shoved all the reserves he had in, and we counter-attacked the Germans at Breville and managed to drive them out, but we lost nearly 200 men in taking it. Lord love it who was in command of some of the commandos there was badly wounded and two commanding officers of the parachute battalions were killed. But the Germans were driven out and uh, never got back into uh, Breville again. And we found out that uh, later in the war that uh, we had taken heavy casualties but we'd inflicted even heavier casualties on them. There was a, a tableau of horror at uh, bridge, uh, attached to us was the fifth uh, black watch, and uh, in one little slip trench there, there were five lads of the black watch with cards on their hand, playing cards, all dead. They were uh, they'd been playing cards, and a shell had burst just above them. Whether it was concussion or not. But these lads were sitting there with playing cards still in their arm, dead. And another one, a German and a Canadian para, a German had beamed the Canadian para to the tree. And the Canadian para, as he was dying, had drawn his fighting knife. We carried a, a fighting knife down a slit in our trousers here. He'd uh, rammed it into the German's back and the, the, both of them were dead. For the next month, a stalemate situation ensued, with the Allies struggling to break out of the beachhead and the Germans failing to push them back. 
At night, we were tormented and bitten alive by mosquitoes. Uh, the Germans had flooded the whole area and these mosquitoes had been breeding there so we had that torment and the Luftwaffe coming over at night who were uh, bombing at random as soon as it was dark over they'd come. In late July the American forces broke out of the western sector of the beachhead, advanced deep inland and began to encircle the German armies in Normandy. By late August, the remaining Axis divisions in this region had been surrounded and captured in the Falaise Pocket. However, large numbers of German troops managed to avoid encirclement and conducted a fighting retreat as the Allies began to retake northern France. But in the beginning of August we were given the orders to advance and we pushed up the coast. Uh, this was during the period uh, of when the main breakout uh, break occurred near Caen. Well, we advanced up the coast. We took Juville, Trouville, and I must admit the Germans fought a very controlled rearguard action with self-propelled guns. They'd mined all the main roads, so we were forced into the fields. Uh, and at the end of August we were reinforced with uh, a Belgian brigade. We were that badly depleted. And uh, I reached the area of Honfleur, round about all that area. The Germans had blown the bridges and retreated into Le Havre. And at that, they said our campaign in Normandy was at an end. We were being taken home to uh, be reinforced. Uh, we found out later that we'd taken, of the 9,000 of us had gone in, 4,900 were killed or wounded or were still missing. The success of the Normandy campaign hastened the collapse of Nazi Germany, which was already being beaten to its knees by cataclysmic defeats in Russia. Uh, when we got back to camp, uh, after, after we'd had a fortnight's leave, they decided that because uh, uh, the way gliders had been landing way off target, that they had to have a parachute section. So uh, that meant an extra shilling a day. Glider-born men got a shilling a day, paratroopers got two shillings a day extra. So I was sent to Ringway. Uh, Manchester Airport, where I did my parachute course, uh, got me wings and got an extra shilling a day. By November 1944, the Western Allies had liberated France, most of Belgium and parts of Holland, and were now threatening to invade Germany itself. But Hitler refused to accept that the war was lost and ordered a major counter-attack through the Ardennes to try and divide the Allied armies as they had done in 1940. We were due to go on leave Christmas because we were steadily being reinforced when suddenly we were all warned to stand by. We're moving. Uh, we were issued with uh, ammunition, grenades, what have you. Rushed down on a special train from Bulford to Dover, Dover to Calais. Christmas Eve and rushed through to the Ardennes and we were then told the Germans had broken through the American lines and uh, we were driven between Dinan and Namur. We arrived there early hours of Christmas Day where we dug in. The weather was atrocious, icy, I've never known the cold like it. To be truthful, luckily we all didn't get hypothermic because we were freezing. I had newspapers stuffed down my legs in between to try and keep warm. And you, you, you don't put your, your bare hand on your rifle, on the metal, it would stick to it, take the skin off your hand, it was that cold, bitter. Did anyone get frostbite? Yes, quite a few. And a lot of fellas uh, were taken into hospital with hypothermia, especially the, if you were stuck in a slip trench. I mean, it was so many degrees below zero at night, you know, it was a 
You get her cold. Did you ever get attacked in those conditions? Oh yes, I. The shell is regular. Did you yeah. ever? Did you ever have to attack anyone? No, we just. We well, just no, we conditions. didn't go on the offensive till the beginning of January. Then we we started advancing around Rochford, Bure, Bondy, on a, a front, and that was when we drove the fifth uh, Panzer Army back. And uh, then New Year's Day. We got orders to advance and clear them out of the village of Bure. Uh, we attacked there and there was um, severe house to house fighting. We were losing heavy casualties, well, they were as well. But uh, we saw two sides of German, German soldiers. Uh, on the second day, we had a lot of wounded lying on the street, lads that had been hit as or were trying to get into the houses which the Germans were occupying. And up the street came a German panther. It was a, a German medium tank. And we thought, oh, for the worst. The medics were attending the wounded. Anyway, the, uh, the tanks clanked to a halt. He flicked open the lid and he spoke perfect English. He said, it's much too dangerous for you men here. Attend to your wounded and then take them away, but don't come back. It's too dangerous for you pulled the lid down and clanked on down the, the street. Earlier that day, we'd run across a house at a place, a little hamlet called Bandy, a couple of miles away, B-A-N-D-E in Belgium, a house boarded up in which an attempt had been made to set fire to it. When it was, the boards were knocked down, we found the cellar packed with bodies all of which are, there were Belgian civilians who had been shot through the back of the head and punched down the, 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 the cellar steps. SS had done it. The Germans, when the Americans had pulled out, the SS had moved in and they rounded up all these lads. One managed to run away and got away and that's how we knew who had done it was SS. But they, uh, they were all shot. All of them then punched down the cellar steps. And uh, as I say, that was the other side of German brutality, German humanity was the one with the tank. I think the official total that we'd lost 168 men taking uh, Buer. But yet you will find in the records very little mention of British troops. But I can assure you that where we were attacking was the tip of the German 5th Panzer Army. Our corporal decided we would break down uh, near Brussels on our way back, which we did. And we all toodled into a nightclub. And I've got to explain to you that francs, five and under, were still legal currency. So when you took prisoners, the first thing you did was you looted them, <laughs> collected all the francs you could. And uh, we went into a nightclub and we were amazed that... Um, all those British troops all there in their best bottle dress, all sipping wine and having the time of their lives. And we thought, 60 miles down the road, we're living in the open, being frozen to death. And these fellas are having the time of Nelly. And yet, I've often thought about it, though we're the same France and German star that I do. But <laughs> the nearest they got was 60 miles from the front. By February 1945, the German offensive had been crushed, and the Battle of the Bulge was over. And that's what we got. We took a lot of prisoners. We had to take them to Dino, mm -hmm. the American camp at Dino. Some of them were SS, that was why we got the order to take them there. What were, what were the prisoners like you took? Uh, a bit subdued, to be truthful. But, uh, we fed them. They did get. They did get fed. But uh, a lot of them said they were glad to be out of it. Did they still? Did they still think Germany would win? No, they knew they were beaten. Because one fellow had said he didn't say it to me, but he said to some others, "You're still in the war. We finished. We're out. You people are still at risk. You're still in it." Mm -hmm. Now it was obvious that the war would soon be over in a matter of months. But there was still more fighting and more killing.
to be done before the conflict would reach its conclusion. Thank <laughs> you.